Let me start us off with a quote from this Andrew Harvey conversation. He says in there, and this sums up everything that we go into, I don't have all of the answers, but I have a way of being fed the answers from the divine. That's it. That's this whole conversation. And I invite you to allow yourself to receive everything that's in this conversation from the subtle transmissions to the maybe not so subtle transmissions, just the fierce roar of the divine feminine coming through in, in Andrew's words, in his expressions, just in his being um, to the very profound, very step-by-step -step how to do this, how to embody the divine, the number one practice that he has seen across all traditions that brings us into union, that brings us, and it's so simple, you're gonna be blown away by how simple this is. But I don't wanna talk a whole lot here. I wanna just invite you to walk into this with open heart, open body, open being, and let, let the mystery, right? Let the mystery, let the subtle realms talk, let the unseen realms talk, let the Shakti come through in the way that it is most meant to come through for you. All right, enjoy this conversation with Andrew Harvey. Oh, and if you want something specific answered, from Andrew Harvey. Let us know in the comments below. Andrew and I at the end of this episode spoke about doing this two, three, four more times. So I would love to hear what topics you want us to go into, what burning questions you have. I'm gonna read absolutely everything and then the next time we come on the podcast, I'm gonna weave into the things that you most wanna hear. So I wanna start by sharing with everyone listening or watching how I met you <laughs> and how it turned my life upside down in the best possible way. Oh, thank you. So I had been on a very um, divine masculine journey spiritually, very much top down, top down, top down. And I saw that Andrew Harvey is coming to talk at a little tiny retreat center in Katoomba, Australia. is <laughs> in Sydney, Australia at the time. I'm like, and Andrew Harvey's doing a little workshop in Katoomba? I, I, I must go. And I'm, I'm reading what it's about. I don't even care what it's about. I just know that I, I need to be at this little gathering. So I show up there's something about sacred marriage, sacred union. I don't even really know what that is at the time. And Andrew proceeds to give this talk that induces tears in me for like two hours, two hours. And there is just this deep recognition in like the depths of my being going, this is it, this is, this is the thing that I have known was there, but I hadn't found it until now. This is the thing that was missing in these dry spiritual traditions that I was into, these dry meditations. And I shouldn't say dry, they were beautiful and glorious and fabulous, but, but it was missing my body. It was missing right. the juice. It was, it was missing that part. Passion, it was missing passion. And without passion, what? Yes. Right? Oh, right. and so... <laughs> The other part that I want to share about this, Andrew, this is the part that I didn't mention to you <laughs> earlier was... Oh, some cheeky story, huh? Oh, oh yes. Uh, yeah. Andrew is on fire. Oh my on God. Yeah. Absolutely. You are on fire. And we are now starting to move into the dark face of the feminine. We're starting to move into those realms. And I had been doing a little bit of feminine work with Mary Magdalene with Mother Mary and Andrew. We're doing experiential stuff and there's maybe 20 of us. It's very small. And so we're, we're moving around and dancing. And so Andrew and the other facilitator both can, are, are watching everyone and can see like kind of where everyone's at with this like embodying the feminine. And he looks at me with this 
dark feminine sword of truth. Ooh. And Andrew, you blasted me one. It was the most glorious like sword to the head that I've ever received. Oh you my blasted God. me. <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful, it was pure love, but it was fierce love. Wow. And it was enough with the light stuff. <laughs> It is time for the dark face of the mother. And I was like, I don't even know who that is. <laughs> well, now we do because she's exploding all over the world, right? We're in this massive Kali event, right? You're absolutely. And I right. am here she is. Yes. Huge opening to that and just this big understanding in a in a very embodied way after that but that is how i met you andrew <laughs> well i'm not going to apologize because oh. i see in front of me someone who is doing the real gorgeous work who's integrating both sides of the mother she's both protective, nourishing, infinitely loving, tender, and she's also unimaginably fierce in the protection of life. Because what she's trying to do is birth a new humanity, an embodied divine humanity, a humanity that's not separated from nature, from creation, and not separated schizophrenically from itself. Oh, all right, well, we're back. Um, we're back. We blew off. We blew out Wi-Fi because clearly we're getting somewhere, somewhere real. How wonderful! So I've had to switch to my phone and be on <laughs> cellular service now. But and we're here. We're we're going to do this. To live with. Yes. Okay. So we left off talking about this this split. You said yes. the split and then poosh, everything went crazy. So can we go back to that? Oh, absolutely. I when look, I'd love to just fling out the words of Kabir, which I live by, yes. because I think these are the key to the birth. <laughs> Thank you, darling. So good, so good, so oh, good. Must you. get, must get. <laughs> Thank you, darling. There are many reasons I love Kabir, but one is that he was born into his fully embodied divine humanity on the earth. And all of his glorious, naked, fierce, direct, passionate, compassionate poetry comes from this realization that, oh my God, we are all holograms of the whole universe. And he says in one of his greatest poems, and I wish that I had any real power and I could write this in letters of gold fire outside the United Nations, because this is it as far as I'm concerned. He says, my father is the absolute Godhead and my mother is the embodied Godhead and I am the divine child dancing for them both on their burning dance floor. I think that's the most comprehensive statement of the new human because it's an absolutely undivided life that we are being called to. He's saying, look, your dad is the infinite light, the transcendent light that forever transcends all of its creations. You are that. But he's also saying, you are this. You are the embodied Godhead, the mother. You've got a mom who is the entire universe and all of its processes, both terrible and beautiful, both, both, both. And when you come into, through grace, that realization that you are truly one with the one in eternal light and in all of the dance of opposites that's happening in this reality, the embodied Godhead that is one with the transcendent, then you realize, oh my God, I am their divine child, dancing for them both. And these words are very carefully chosen because what this birth that's trying to take place through this terrifying rending and global dark night that we're living through, what this birth is, is the birth of a fully embodied divine human 
humble, wild, passionate, compassionate child, innocent, naked, loving, and prepared to dance for them both, dance for the light and dance for this massive evolutionary process that inevitably involves tremendous suffering. Dance for them both, dance for them inwardly in adoration and reverence and surrender, dance for them outwardly in focused, wise, urgent, sacred action. Dance for them both on their burning dance floor. And if, if you don't know what that means at this moment, just turn on the news. The dance floor is burning. But if you think about that image, when the dance floor is burning, you have to dance even more passionately, agilely, shrewdly, so as not to burn yourself. So those lines for me lay down a marvelous challenge to us all. And what that challenge to me is, is to get into the deepest wisdom through grace of the sacred marriage, the union in the one of all of the opposites, heart, mind, <coughs> body, soul, deep masculine, deep feminine, transcendence, imminence, profound in a spiritual practice, wise, urgent, focused action fueled by the wisdom of that practice, bring them all together through grace and let yourself use this tragic, terrible time for its real deep secret purpose, which is to birth you finally and forever into your true divine humanity. Wow, that's what's happening for me. And that's what's happening in me. So I'm not talking about something I read about in the book. Why I love Kabir is that he puts words, stunning words to this extraordinary transformation. And he's not alone. The great evolutionary mystics through history have known that we would come to a time in which she would dance on every level. Kali would dance. The mother, in all of her glory and terror and power, would dance. But she would dance not to annihilate us and wipe us off the earth, but to transfigure us, to make us finally real, utterly human, utterly divine, at the same time, in and under her, and so capable of birthing a wholly new way of being and doing everything. And this is what's going on, because on the one hand, you see horrifying suffering, death, madness, democracy in potential ashes, the climate collapsing, unspeakable horror, really, on every level. And on the other hand, there is emerging an amazing new vision of our evolutionary possibility and absolutely <laughs> extraordinary people on every level risking their whole lives and their whole truth to birth a new world. What an amazing time to be alive. I have to ask you this question, Andrew, your- Second, somebody is knocking at my door in the middle of a <laughs> Love it. I'm in the middle. Oh wow, this is great. This is, but you see, this is what is this time is like, isn't it? It is such a boiling time. Everything is yes. coming up. And, and I think this is such a great example of just life. Like yes. instead, it, it's just it's everywhere. It's yes. everywhere. It's at the person knocking on the door. It's in yes. the Wi-Fi crapping yes. out, it's shifting over to phones. Well, it's, it's also, an older, I, I just wrote a bit about the vaccination thing, and I'm I'm very much for vaccination. And I got such a wild torrent of rage from people who refused to be vaccinated as if I was the Antichrist. I mean, my God, I'm just saying, please get vaccinated and try and help yourself. Anyway, it's I accept all of this because I know that this madness is part of the birth of a new kind of sanity, but it's a very testing time for all of us, isn't it? Yeah. This was my question, Andrew, is, I mean, your work is so broad and wide and vast and goes into so many different aspects, but they're all connected. They're all connected. Okay, can you They're share that piece? Different. Yes. Maybe share Everything that connection that piece. That is connected. Yes, because my fundamental 
love is for the mother. And I love her as Carly. I've always loved the Black Madonna and Carly, these visions, these marvelous symbols of the fierce mother. Because I've known all my life, really, that <clears throat> we have to go through a massive revolution if we're going to survive. We have to go through a massive evolutionary revolution if we're going to survive, because the kind of world we've created out of separation, out of hubris, out of the desire to dominate nature, out of heartless lack of conscience about injustice and the crazy ways in which our systems oppress and dominate women, gay people, the poor, the whole enchilada, if we continue that way, we're going to die out and take a great deal of nature with us. I've known this since my 20s. And in my 20s, I woke up to her. And I was very blessed because I woke up to her in and through Sri Aurobindo, the greatest evolutionary mystic <laughs> the world's ever seen, who was absolutely adamant about one thing. And that was that the new human would be born through the return of the full mother, the light mother and the dark mother, the two faces of the same unknowable but very potent mystery. And that was ingrained in me in my 20s. And then what I've done is to dedicate myself to the bringing back of the divine feminine in the fullness of her glory and her power. So all the different things that I've done, all of them, have had that secret impulse behind them. And now, as I approach 70, I realized, my God, it, they're much more coherent than I knew. I was really working in the dark, as we all do. But now I can see the interlink of all my work. And it's my offering to the world at this moment. This, I, so when there's an enormous amount of grace or light or Shakti that goes, goes on, I get really dizzy. It doesn't happen very often, but Andrew, <laughs> hearing you speak, I'm over here like, whoa. Uh, that's the Shakti. We, she, this is why it's so important not to sentimentalize the mother, isn't it? Of course she's love. Of course she wants all of us to flower. Of course she blesses us entirely. But she's also aware that we've gone mad. And she's now letting this terrifying dance of hers unfold, not to punish us, but to wake us the hell up and to show us that if we continue in one way, we're going to die out and take a great deal of nature quite soon. But if we really undergo the kind of massive transformation that we can undergo if we're sincere and passionate and love her in her and in the whole overarching vision of the sacred marriage, then there is unbelievable miracle ahead, unbelievable transformation ahead. And it's all up to us. Are we going to stick with the old magical thinking of the new age, which is garbage as far as I'm concerned? Are we going to go on playing God with our policies and our economic depredation of the world? If we are, we're finished. But if we can uh, see the signs that are exploding now everywhere in this great death rebirth dance she's doing, and if we can wake up to the birth that is possible, and if we can align ourselves with the laws of that birth, and if we can take as our inspiration the fundamental mystical wisdom of the world and the great test of the great evolutionary mistakes, then, oh my God, we will be born into the next level of our evolutionary destiny. And nobody knows what's going to happen. There's nobody who knows. I asked the Dalai Lama three years ago in Australia, um, I called him in the, <laughs> in the corridor, and we know each other for many years, and I said, yeah. look, your holiness, what is going to happen? Do you have any idea? And he said, of course not, nobody knows. But I know one thing. And then he said, prepare for the worst, but work tirelessly for the best. Yeah. I think that's it. It's a perfect phrase. We have to be wise. We have to be sober. We have to be really clear that we're in a potential extinction crisis. Yeah. We also have to be aware that the great mystics know that the dark night can be the birth canal of a new kind of human being. 
And we have to really align with those laws now because that's our last best hope. And it's a great hope. I've been through a terrifying dark night and it didn't result in my extinction. It resulted in my ragged resurrection. So that's what I'm hoping to convey to everybody. Stay steady, do the inner work, embrace Kali, love her for her wild dancing and let her transform you into a warrior midwife, someone who fights peacefully for justice and harmony and balance through sacred action and someone who also pours out compassionate help to everyone. This is it. This is how I try and live my life and I fail all the time, but I know that this is the real truth. Yeah, yeah. I, I would love to share this piece with you, Andrew, is every time that I go to create a workshop on reclamation of the feminine, it ends up being a dark goddess workshop, a dark goddess retreat. I just did a piece on sexual healing and awakening, oh, a four oh day God. in person retreat. Andrew, we ended up doing two days and this surprises me. It's me just following the energy, following the Shakti. What serves most here? What serves most here? What serves most here? Bonding to the pain, yes. Do we go into the lovers yet? Do we go into sacred? No, dark goddess, dark goddess, dark goddess, dark right. goddess, dark goddess right. for the cleansing, the purification, the transformation, the, the, that like fierce radical grace that she brings. And it right. is, it, it is nonstop in, and so I can- Well, you're responding think. to what's happening in the world. It's clearly a manifestation of the dark goddess, but the dark goddess is love in its <laughs> most naked, passionate form. And yes. it's saying, she's saying to us, wake up to the traumas that you've had. Oh, wake up to the traumas yeah. you're inflicting. Don't run away from them into magical thinking because they contain priceless truths which can truly empower you. But you can't be empowered by them if you don't face them. And if you don't do the rugged, ragged work of healing them. Oh, and that is so, that is it. it you sharing that, you know, underpinning your whole life's work is, is the mother, is the dark yes. face of the, just the mother. And for me, this last year has been opening up to working more with sacred union, more with this, more with that. And yes, going, it must wow, be are things union. shifting for me? Are things shifting for me? But it was been, your devotion is to her. Your, your, for me, this is just, your devotion, it's to her. It is to Absolutely. her. And because it is she is the, the force the that brings the to union her. too. But it's not just to her alone, it's to her in the sacred marriage because yes. you cannot yes. have a marriage without the full restoration of the bride who's been kept down in the cellar with duct tape over her mouth, strapped to a chair. Let her come up in all her glory and let there be a revolution in the masculine too. The real masculine is forged by real love of the real mother and real desire to protect the laws of the real mother. So this is a revolution for women and for men so that both can bring both the deep masculine and the deep feminine into radical union in themselves, which is why I talk about the new human being, a warrior and a midwife together. The warrior force is the supreme gift of the real divine masculine, the warrior in defense of life, in defense of truth, in defense of compassion, in defense of justice. And the midwife is the supreme blessing of the Mary side of the mother, the Durga side of the mother, the Tao. All of the light mothers, which are all different faces of that beautiful, holy love that is the mother, you have to bring them together because Kali herself is a warrior midwife. She is the ultimate warrior saying, this has got to stop and it's got to stop now. And I'm going to create a crisis in which if you don't stop it, you'll die out and take this whole gorgeous, beautiful world with you, a great deal of it. But if you listen to me 
And if you listen to my roaring and rearrange everything in humility around that roaring, oh my God, you'll be born as my true, naked, fearless, amazing child. And that will be my dream for you come true. My whole being is dancing in absolute ecstasy. Absolute you know that, don't you? It's something ecstasy. you know. And, and what we create in our lives from that place, that state of being, what we create, even from a conversation that we create in the world, how we create family, how we raise our babies, how we, and this probably weaves How we love practices. and encourage each other, how we, as we're doing right now. And I'm hoping yes. we're doing for all the people listening. This is Kali mother love, isn't it? Yes, and this like kind of weaves into almost like sacred activism to me is oh, like this marriage of the two right and then what there's no love without it's... action love is sentimental without action you can't <sighs> say you love the world and love animals while a million species are on the edge of extinction and aren't doing anything to stand up for animals you can't say you have compassion for the poor oppressed by this disgusting crazy system we've created without standing up for the poor you can't say you're terrified by the prospect of the birth of fascism in america through the lunacy that is raging now without really risking sacred action sacred action is love in action there's no love without action if you say you love me and just sit there and glow well that's sweet but i won't feel that love until you really reach out and do something to show me that love because i'm trying to show it here right now speech has to become action yeah yeah yeah, there was something that you shared um, in some talk you were giving, and it was sacred activism is not what we're called to do. That's not the first question to ask. Right, right. It's, it's a state of being, how we yeah. must be, and then the doing follows the being. And so I want to just bring that into really- Oh my God, that is so on. important. Because in a time like this, you know, which, which is so paralyzing, despairing, crazy making, et cetera, people are always asking, what should I do? But they're asking it from the old consciousness. So whatever they do from that consciousness, whatever we do from the old consciousness is bound to be partly sterile and barren. So the first question for all of us continually, and I never, I don't feel I've answered this question. I'm answering this question with everything I am every day, right? The real question is, who am I meant to be in a time like this? And the answer that's coming to me very clearly, loud and clear, is that you are meant to be utterly grounded in your deathless transcendent self and utterly focused in your embodied mother divine self on real action in the real world, pouring yourself out from a place of deepest inner fearless security in loving regenerative action. That to me completes me and makes me a warrior midwife and makes me someone who is creating the new world with and in the father, mother, the two sides of the one. My father is the absolute Godhead. My mother is the embodied Godhead. And I am that divine child dancing for them both on that burning dance floor. I'm dancing and everybody is called to dance. And you can only dance if you know the music and if you're responding to the music and you've got to respond from the fullness of your body and you have to be balanced in the depths of your body otherwise you fall over and knock everybody else out on the dance floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh andrew i am loving this and that i'm almost makes sense to you darling it makes absolute sense to me it makes absolute sense to me there's a word that i want to throw in really quickly i think this term comes from the direct path that body of work that you yes. did 
And I that was think the it's first the revolution. revolution, yeah, that I tried to <laughs> settle like, yeah. No it's more blues, really no more religions, no more, no more direct connection, which is our birthright. And I recommend that audiobook. Yeah. I recommend that audiobook to everyone. And it thank you. My sense is it really supports this conversation that we're having. Oh, I mean, yeah. everything that you've done supports this conversation. But that one, it's like a distilled here it is. Yes. <laughs> And yes. there's a term in there, the sacred androgyne. Yes. Can you speak to that? And I'm, can you just speak to that? I have been meditating in that stinking term and feel in my body. It's not even a, a term. It's, it's, a, it's a gnosis in my being. Yes. And can you just talk to that a bit? It's been something. Well, I'd been... love to. I mean, because when I look at you and feel you, I feel both your enormous feminine beauty and force and clarity and passion for justice in the world, all of that I feel, but I also feel that you are integrating the best of the masculine to the steadiness, the force, the commitment to radical transformation, the clarity of the laws, the clarity of the laws and the wildness of love have to be combined. And that is what's being born. What is being born on the earth are men and women who are prepared to go through this great mother revolution. And what the mother revolution makes in all of us is a meeting of all of the opposites. We know we're transcendent and we know we're utterly imminent and we know both are holy. We know we, we are bodies and we are souls and that the soul and the body is not two, but one. We know that we are heart and we are mind and the heart is in the mind and the mind is in the heart, one. And we come to know through the grace of the path that we have available to us, whether we are men or women, all the lovely, holy, wild powers of the sacred feminine and all the lovely, wild, holy powers of the sacred masculine. And we come to know that they're in a relationship of passionate, mutual lovemaking within the one. And we come to know that as that fusion starts to become more real, more electric, more natural within us, we are born into a wholly new level of humble power, humble divine human power. And that is the sacred androgyne. And at the heart of all of the religious mystical systems, I've discovered because I've you know, spent years explaining all of them, is the vision of a human being that is a sacred androgyne that has fused together all of the opposites and been born into the mystery of presence in action. And you can look, for example, at two great examples I'm thinking of. One is the Dalai Lama, for example. When you spend any time around the Dalai Lama, you know that he has, on the one hand, the, the clearest, fiercest, purest possible masculine mind and heart. He is the sacred masculine in one glorious form. He's just as much the sacred mother, the sacred loving feminine because he's constantly reaching out and loving and emanating the most amazing, tender compassion. He's both. I saw him once, and this is such a marvelous example of what I'm trying to say. He was touring America and I was part of a group that was touring with him and he was leaving and he's a king, you know, so he was going up the, he was going on to the, um, the macadam of the airport, and the guys who'd been um, guarding him, these four butch marines who'd been guarding him, were standing there saluting him. And he didn't just say, you know, hello, George, thank you so much. He stood before these amazing, beautiful men, and he put his hands on their cheeks, and he poured out love to them and thanked them as a mother would thank her child. And these guys continued to salute, but the tears were running down their cheeks because they'd never been seen and loved by a man so beautifully, so fearlessly. 
And they'd been honored, not just as amazing guys by an amazing guy, but they'd been honored by an amazing guy who was also a holy mother in a male body. That's the wonderful example of the sacred marriage. And that's where we're all going if we allow ourselves to. And another one that I think of a lot is the great woman guru. She was much more than a guru. She was a in living incarnation of divine love, Ananda Mai Ma, who left her body in the 80s. She was the mystical queen of India for 50 years. Everybody revered her as the living mother. But if you really get into a deep relationship with her, you realize, oh, she is. Kali Ma, she is all of the mothers, but she also has this amazing, clear, vibrant masculine that she uses from the deepest compassion when she needs it. So men are challenged to absolutely integrate the whole holy feminine into their masculine, which revolutionizes their masculine and makes it the real sacred masculine, which is hopelessly and finally in love with the feminine. And every woman is challenged in the most wonderful way to integrate the full beauty, the full glory, the full power of the sacred masculine so she, her feminine is profoundly in love with, so that she too can be born into her unique expression of that fusion and that sacred androgyny. This is the key to the new human, I think. Does that help? I'm, I'm with you 100,000%, and it's exactly what I feel in my own my own journey, my myself, and it's what I see in the work that I do. With also, don't you see it in the world? I see it. I'll tell you where I see it. I see it in, I happen to be meeting at this moment a lot of amazing young men in their 20s. The straight oh. boys, but they are so loving. Yes, they yes, 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 yes. This old gay uncle of theirs. They adore me. They really, really know that I have their best interests at heart and they pour out their hearts towards me. They love their buddies. They love their gay friends. They truly want to turn up honorably and tenderly and compassionately and virally with their women. And they just take my breath away, these guys. And I see it in the extraordinary women, especially the African-American women who are arising now, the Stacey Abrams, these so many through the Me Too movement, through the Black Lives Matter movement, so many absolutely astounding women who are saying enough of all of this BS, but are saying it with masculine force and clarity and feminine fierce compassion united in a way that gives us all an example of how to be warrior midwives so it's here on the earth this new sacred androgyny is boiling up in this alchemical stew we're in and if you've got eyes to see it you'll see it everywhere look Absolutely. at it's happening in the attitudes of awakened men towards the feminine towards the creation towards protecting the creation look at the massive empowerment that's happening to women who say you cannot Tell me what to do with my body. You've got to pay me equally. My gifts are extraordinary and valuable. And I'm just as holy as any man. And I have a really unique contribution to make. That is sacred androgyny in action, isn't it? Absolutely. And I see it too in the younger generations. As like mundane seemingly as it is pushing into, I don't want to be identified as a gender. Right. Don't call me a male or a female, call me a they or a we. There are apparently 18 different categories now, which might be a bit excessive, but still it's a, a wild, ragged step in the best direction, isn't it? I don't want you to tell me that I'm just a, a guy and I'm, if you think that Andrew is just this male talking, you, you don't know what's going on in my whole psyche. If I think you as just this beautiful woman, wonderful though that is, I don't recognize all the ways in which your masculine is also rising, that you're coming into this new fusion in which we see each other as complex, fluid beings instead of binary beings, which are so boring. But it's going on, it's happening. My straight guy friends 
behave like lesbians now with you. It's wonderful. And my yes. women friends are finding wholly new capacities to embrace the masculine that they might have been decrying and, and despising in the first iteration of feminism. It needed to define itself, but now a mature, more vibrant feminism is arising, which honors and acknowledges the masculine and honors and needs the masculine integrated with the feminine. So this revolution is not something that you and I are just spitballing about. It's something that we're recognizing with joy as the other madness happens, because as the other regressions happen, when everybody says, you know, gays are going to, the fundamentalists saying gays are going to burn in hell. Oh yeah, right. And women have to be barefoot and pregnant. So some people are, many people are regressing horribly, but many, many people are being born into this new fusion in a way that I think is, just takes my breath away. Who knew that we would have gay marriage? being accepted by 65% of the American population. I mean, I remember when to be gay was a horrible stigma and we all suffered horribly coming out, all that stuff. That, thank God, is no longer here. It is still here in certain communities and we have to be aware of that. But my God, for the majority of people, there is unimaginable new opportunity for the deepest self-expression. And that can only lead to a far healthier world if we do everything through sacred activism to preserve it. Oh, God, Andrew, you were just lighting up my whole being. My whole being. You know this stuff. You know I it. I know, but it's so stuff. beautiful to not be the one talking it all the time and just be sitting here receiving your love and your gifts and your light and your just the wisdom pouring through you. It's just such a gift to just sit here. And, and it's a gift for me to receive you, darling, because... You know, you can speak, but unless you speak, you can only play as well as the people who listen to you as a musician. And I'm, I know that I'm being listened to by, with your whole being and you're responding from the fullness of your own evolution. So I'm not a guru. I'm a friend. I'm not, I don't believe in the guru stuff. That's too easy to sit there saying you have all the answers. I don't have all the answers, but I do have a way to be fed the answers I need from the mother father. And that's the way that I'm offering in my work. I love this, Andrew. And this is what I would love to weave into because I can feel people listening or will be listening, getting to this point of, well, oh, this is great what they're talking about. How do I take the next step on my own path? So if we could talk about that and give whatever comes around that, I feel like this is the most important thing that we could do now. Well, there are several steps, it seems to me. The first step is to face the extremity of the crisis and stop having magical thinking about it, just to be brave enough to realize that we are now in the definitive crisis of our evolutionary journey and that there is a global dark night and it is exploding and it does threaten our survival. And you can't not face that because facing it, I've found, doesn't necessarily drive you into paralysis and despair. It drives you into the deepest possible search for who you really are. And that gets to the second point. Believe the mystics. Believe all of the mystics of all of the traditions who say with one voice, you are divine. And you've been given as an original blessing divine consciousness you've been blessed by that and believe them when they say that the whole point of being on the earth is not just to read that and think oh i'm divine i'm divine but to realize what that truly 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 means because if you do get anywhere near that realization you start dancing naked to tina turner around your place I have done this, I'm afraid to say, because there are moments when you are so overwhelmed with gratitude and amazement at being through grace, the living divine child of the father mother, that you can't do anything else but take your clothes off and just say, thank you, Lord. And I am a great lover of Tina Turner, so who I believe is a real shamanic wisdom teacher. And so it's Tina for me, but whoever it is for you, be prepared for those moments of ecstasy. 
The third thing is, is that in order to realize this, you need to plunge into deep sacred practice. And the most powerful practice every evolutionary mystic, and this is true of all of the religions, says, is the simplest. And I'm a great advocate of totally simple practice. And that is saying the name of God by whatever name you worship the divine. And if you're a Buddhist, you can say some of the great Buddhist mantras, Buddhists don't believe in, in God in that way, but they believe in a, a source, a shunyata, the emptiness that creates all things. And it's just, for me, it's another name for God. But they are entitled, of course, to their own glorious philosophy. Whatever you believe in, adore the face that is turned to you of the divine and say its name in the heart as often and wildly and tenderly and rapturously as you can. And you will discover what Kabir says when he says, the name of God through age after age binds me directly to God. So by saying the name in the heart with reverence and passion, you discover over time that you'll be taught directly the different stages of the mysterious unfolding of your true nature. So that's what needs to be done. And there's a fourth stage. Realize something. And I'd just love to tell a story here about <laughs> the Dalai Lama. I was interviewing the Dalai Lama on the day that he was going to win the Nobel Prize in Oslo. I was sent by Vogue or L, I don't remember which, as Little Pixie was sent to inter interview the great Kona, you know. So I was sitting in this long oblong room in this hotel in Oslo with the Dalai Lama alone. And I asked him absolutely everything on my mind and he answered so beautifully. And it was two hours, it was two hours with him. And at the end of those two hours, I couldn't get out of the chair because I was so overwhelmed by his presence because he is the sweetest of people, but there is this vast, vast force of embodied love around him. And he came up to me and he hoisted me up and I was momentarily breast to breast with him. I was, my breast was against his breast. So I looked up at him and said, we'll never be in this position again. What's the meaning of life? And he roared with laughter. I mean, you, that roar is still echoing in every cell of my being. And then he got very, very, very quiet and very strong. And he pointed at me and he said, the meaning of life is to embody the transcendent. And as he said, this golden energy went up and down. My, so I was even more out by then. Then he took my hand and he led me to the door and very tenderly said goodbye to me. But you cannot just realize your divine nature. You have to embody it. Bring it down. Rumi says love flows down. So your heart mind opens to the transcendent. But then your job is to unite that realization with your mind. So your mind becomes a servant of that realization. Unite it with your heart. So your heart becomes an organ of universal love. And then do the difficult but wonderful work of uniting it with the cells of your body. So your body becomes love's body, like His Holiness's body is clearly love's body, because that's all he's doing is reaching out, loving, loving, loving all the time. And that means action. So the last part is to put what you are being given by the divine that loves you so much into action, sacredly inspired action and service on behalf of the creation, on behalf of animals, on behalf of the poor, on behalf of the rich that are lost in ignorance and greed, on behalf of every single sentient being, tirelessly, relentlessly, with humor, with joy, with passion. If you can combine those four stages, you'll be you won't be spared suffering, my friends. It will, you will go through a lot of suffering, but you'll know what the suffering is asking of you, to go deeper into surrender, to go deeper into love, to go deeper into service. And you will realize whatever happens to the world, that you are the divine child of the father, mother, dancing for them both on their burning dance floor. And a great joy will be in your life arising from the source of joy itself that is the divine.
<laughs> like this? I love this, Andrew. <laughs> and I know that our community is going to love this. Absolutely love, 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 love this. It, and well, I even it, it happens to be the it's not just Andrew saying this, because you know, I've spent 40 years plunging into all the mystical traditions and being initiated into them and the Aboriginal and Indigenous traditions. And at the heart of all of them is this. Yeah. This is yeah. not my version, it's just my distilled version for our time, for myself and for everyone whom I love and who wants to listen, of the essential evolutionary wisdom of humanity. And that's my job at the moment, to distill it, to make it available, to make it simple so that people can resonate with it. It's not simple in how it works itself out, but if you get into the direct connection, you'll be given the wisdom you need stage by stage the people you need will appear the books you need will fall open at the pages you need you'll hear the podcast that will open you you'll see on tv somebody who gives you the peace that you've been waiting for because the whole universe wants you to be born into your empowered human divine self and if you align with that there is so much grace heading your way, including the grace of a appalling crisis, which should wake you the hell up to the complete sterility of any other solutions but this one. That's a grace. There is a question that I am burning to ask you, and it's something that comes up in our- well, This is America, so, you know, you, this is not in my contract. I, of course, Sally, <laughs> Not that one. <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd love to try. I'll certainly <laughs> give it my best. So this, this piece around like right relationship with teacher, right relationship with book, with tradition, with I see this as something that we are, many are struggling with and working through. And I know that you have many, many stories and so much experience with this. It's and a wonderful question. And the way you're talking about direct connection, direct connection, but also the the television show bringing you this right thing, and the, the dynamics here and open and bringing you this. Yes, so please, can you share anything that comes around oh, this? I think it's so important to make your relationship with the great traditions of the past a marriage of opposites. On the one hand. You need to be, I believe, in a position of humility and reverence, knowing that even the patriarchal mystical traditions have a great deal to teach you. They've been over-biased towards transcendence, towards the light, but they know a thing or two about that light. And if you don't know what they know, you're going to be bereft. So be reverent, be attentive, but also have one eye completely open to the patriarchal bias towards transcendence, the patriarchal bias towards rejecting matter and privileging spirit, the patriarchal bias towards body hatred and sex hatred in ways that have disfigured and let out the feminine. So the way I find is most useful is to ask the mother to guide you in your reverential reading. Ask her to show you the truth of the teacher in front of you. And what my criterion is this, because I've been very blessed. I've been very blessed to have the greatest teachers. The Dalai Lama is not my guru, he's my beloved. I was able to meet the greatest living Christian mystic Bede Griffiths and become not his disciple, but his beloved. And what both of them show me is their modeling, not of the answers, but of the way to learn the answers. So great teachers model learning. They are unafraid of confessing what they don't know. They're unafraid of being called on their shadow because they want to know. They want to work on their shadow. They don't ever claim total omniscience and total authority because they've been blasted by authentic mystical experience, which has reduced them to ash on multiple occasions. So they know that claiming to know everything about that would be insane 
And there's a wonderful story about Rumi, which really gets this. There's a young guy who is in Constantinople and he hears about the greatest living mystical poet who's now in his late 60s. And he's desperate to meet him. He's a young Christian monk. And although the Rumi's a Muslim, he knows that this guy's got it. So I better go and see him. So he goes, he walks all the way from Constantinople to Konya. And as he's coming into Konya, he sees this glorious old man walking towards him. And he knows that it's Rumi, because Rumi knows that he's coming. And he bows down to Rumi. And he steps up and he sees that Rumi is bowing down to him. And this goes on 32 times. And the young man who by this time <coughs> has had all of his concepts of the master and the yeah. disciple shattered, cries out to Rumi, he says, why are you bowing to me? I'm a crazy young man who doesn't know much, but I know you, you know so much. And I've come to him, like, why are you bowing down to me? And Rumi says something so amazing. He first says, he quotes a hadith from the prophet. He says, blessed is the person who is just in his honor, chaste in his beauty and loves all sentient beings. So he gives the perfect instruction. And then he says something really amazing. And this is Rumi having poured out the world's greatest mystical poetry and being revered by his whole world. He says, if I did not show you my nothingness, what would I be useful for? So only trust a teacher who shows you his or her nothingness, who models for you how to learn, who is humble, who is accessible to your objections and protests, and who is willing to be called on their shadows because what they're trying to model is absolute sincerity about doing the work as humbly as possible. And if you're lucky and blessed enough to find a teacher like that, love them with your whole soul and heart, mind and body, but don't give up your life to them. Take their example as a motivation for you becoming exactly like them. Bede used to say to me often, because he knew how much I loved him and that, 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 that was dangerous. He used to say to me, look, he said, I know you love me and I know you see me and I know you honor me with your whole being. But I want you to know that I know who you are. And I don't want you to be a copy of me. I want you to be totally Andrew. So any teacher that wants you to copy them or mirror them or dress like them or wear white on Sundays like them and blue on Mondays and all that horse shit, just bow to them and get the hell out because the real teachers are not interested in being copied. After all, they fulfilled their roles. What they're truly dedicated to is inspiring the hell and heaven out of you so that you become the glorious, humble, wild, passionate, compassionate human divine being that they see in you. And Bede said something to me at the end of his life, which absolutely knocked me out. He said, you know, you think I've done all these amazing things, and I, I hope I have. But he said, you and your generation are going to do even more amazing things. And this is what Jesus says in John's gospel. He said, and you can do greater things than me. I once quoted that to an evangelical who said, I wish he hadn't said that, but he did say that. And that's the whole meaning of his mission. He's not wanting to be adored as the son of God. He's wanting you to see the way he lives his life as an aligned life with the great evolutionary spirit and do the same thing in your own wild, wonderful way and do greater things than him. That's a real teacher. That is so powerful, Andrew, that it leaves me completely speechless, really and truly. Like you have just summarized it and have cut through all of the, the bullshit into here, th this, this. Be wise, be discerning, but always know that the ultimate responsibility is not a teacher's, it's your own. How, yes. But if you don't have the power of adoration of the holy, 
you're not going to be helped much on the path. Recognize the holy, and they're everywhere. They're in the, I remember once in Benares, I lived in Benares, the craziest place on earth, my favorite place. And every day I'd go to buy toothpaste or soap from this old toothless woman who had this shop and she was my buddy. We adored each other. And I spent, I gave her money because she just broke my heart with her sweetness. And one day she said, okay, she said, you love me, I love you, sit down. And I thought, oh my God, sit down. So I sat down in this filthy shop and she said, Shiva is everything. Shiva is the ground, Shiva is me, Shiva is you, Shiva is the toothpaste, Shiva is the soap. And she was emanating enlightened energy. She was holy. And I bowed to her. She was my guru. She was my sacred beloved friend exchanging what she'd learned over a lifetime to someone she loved and recognized as sincere. That's how a teacher, a real teacher is. They're so in love with you that they're prepared to do anything to show you how beautiful you are. Oh, oh Andrew, I want to keep talking forever. Like I yeah, never want to true. stop and I want everyone to be able to hear this. It's so important, not just because it's, it's not important for me, for me, because I know this and you know this, but it's so important that people now claim their agency. And that doesn't mean rejecting teachers. It means treating them as sacred friends at the highest level of respect, but really always weighing deeply what they say and then putting it into action yourself in your own unique way. That's the way. Then you don't have guru systems. You don't have priests. You don't have hierarchical people telling you what to do. What you have on the earth are people who are discovering the enormity of their true evolutionary destiny and sharing it with wild love with everybody else and welcoming everybody else to the feast that the Divine Mother has prepared for them in the middle of this burning dance floor. Andrew, I know that there are going to be people listening who are going to want to read books, do programs with you. And I would love oh, for you to share, like, what is coming up for you? Where can people find you? Where can they do more? Well, I have a website and I can, I'm with what I'm doing now is really doing staged events with amazing women. I, I love to work with the glorious women. I did a wonderful workshop with Eve Ensler, the great wild V. Yes. Yeah, oh, oh, was called Eve Ensler, now she's called V. And she, my God, the two of us together it was <laughs> insane, but it really works. She's extraordinary. So that's available. It's called The Revolution of the Mother. And I'd love you to acquaint yourself with her wild, gorgeous teaching and the alchemy that happened between us. I'm about to do in October an event with the great Linda Tucker, who is the protector of the white lions in South Africa. And she brings her mother-inspired vision of sacred leadership from the lions, and I bring sacred activism together. But most of all, my darling friends, what I beg you is to get acquainted with the great revolutionary of this evolutionary shift, which is a man called Kabir. And Kabir lived in the 14th century and woke up completely to this next level of human evolution. And he said to the Hindus, you're nuts. And he said to the Muslims, you're nuts. And he said to the Muslim Christians, you're nuts. And he said, go for the direct connection. God will teach you directly and you won't just float out. You'll be born right here into what he calls simple union with the one and you live the divine life like I'm living it on the earth. He didn't claim to be a guru. He was a buddy, a wild, fierce, glorious, tender buddy. And I've done this book called Turn Me to Gold, which is the, for me, the Bible of the new transformation. His work is destined like Rumi's work for our time. And the, these two glorious 
devotees of the sacred feminine in its fullness are coming back now to guide us forward. And I'm about to produce another book, which is 365 translations of Kabir, new translations, which I did in the middle of Covidia, as my protest against all the madness, um, called Engoldenment. And I've just also made a film in Benares on Kabir and why he's so, 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 so important for us now. He is my ideal of the kind of friend that we need. Like the Rumi story I told you, which shows you what kind of friend Rumi is. Kabir is the same kind of friend. He's a little fierce. He's always saying, wake the hell up. But he's saying it as a buddy, not as somebody trying to shame you. He's just trying to shake you so you get with it, so you can have the most glorious life possible. So I beg you to make friends with the two great universal friends of the next stage of evolution, which I've dedicated my life to, Rumi, which I've spent 40 years with. But now, especially for now, because Kabir is so ruthless and so loving, Kabir, Kabir, Kabir. Remember that scene in, in um, The Graduate when Dustin Kaufman, Hoffman is taken out to the swimming pool by the guy and the guy says, I have one word to say to you. I think you're going to have the revelation of existence revealed. And he says, plastics. Well, I have one word to say to you, and that is Kabir. Get with Kabir. He'll rock your world in the rightful way. And he gives the most incredible teaching about the direct connection so simply take him into the core of your life and use him to cabarize yourself to become wild holy naughty joyful and absolutely committed to building a new world out of the ashes of the old i feel him so strongly for this moment in time i'm absolutely with you on that and feel it now now He's coming back now. These Rumi came back first to soften uh -huh. up for Kabir, as he did in my life, because without Rumi's glorious tenderness, I don't think I would have been ready for Kabir's flame. But, yeah, the sword coming down. But if you bring the two together, then you have the whole enchilada. It's so amazing what's being offered to us. And the last yeah. thing I'd say to all of you is, you know, the most important thing at the moment is to stay inspired, is to stay inspired. Love the heaven out of your friends. If you're lucky enough, as I do, to have a cat or a, a companion animal in your life, just adore them. They will show you amazing things and they will help you and ground you. Love the creation. Go out into nature and celebrate her and realize that you are called to sacred action. And the way you find that out is asking yourself one question. What of all the crazy stuff that's happening in the world breaks my heart the most? If you ask that question, really, you'll find what you're being called to address. And when I asked that question of myself 10 years ago, I realized that I'm, I'm heartbroken by a lot of stuff, as you can imagine, oh. and outraged. But what outrages and breaks my heart the most is the treatment we give to animals. So I've become a, a relentless advocate for animals. And I have this amazing collaborator for sacred activism called Jill Angelo. And she has turned her little farm into a sanctuary for battered animals. It's called Moon Dog Farm. And if anything that I've said inspires you, Please go to Moon Dog Farm because it's something that I relentlessly advocate for. She does it on no money. Help her. Give $20, $100, or sell your house preferably and give it. No, give her some cash in my name and in the name of the mother so she can continue to do her holy work with her amazing animals. And the you can continue to be inspired by her because her example is setting a light thousands of people who are turning their own houses and their places into sanctuaries. We need sanctuaries for animals on the earth and Jill is the pioneer of this. And I'm so proud that she's my collaborator and co-creator. So go to the website and help this glorious wild woman.
who keeps me straight. And in, I tell you, being living with Jill, in, I, I talk to Jill every day she, for 10 years. She helped me co create sacred activism. And she reads me the riot act and she is the fierce feminine in action and she keeps me straight. So this is not somebody who is my humble collaborator. She's somebody who brings the fullness of her fierce feminine wisdom and which I need. And you will be so amazed when you actually encounter the work that she's doing. I love this. We um, we donate um, our we call it we have this program called Living Close to the Bone, and it's well, really this living, right? Living this like razor edge of truth, just living so close to our truth. And um, every month we donate a portion of that membership to a charity. And well, come January please, first. Please do it for Moondog Farm and everybody out there. Go and do. We need now to encourage the heroic sacred activists who are stepping up and risking their lives and their finances. Most of the people doing amazing work in this world now are horribly underfunded. Yeah. She's one of them. Help her and look around for all the people who are saying, I can't stand it anymore and I'm not going to complain. I'm going to act and make my life a ragged beacon of light. Help them, help them, and you'll be helping yourself become more authentic, more real, more engaged. Absolutely. Andrew, thank you so much. This was inspiration. So you thank kind you, of those Johnny. closing words saying, stay inspired and to me this was inspiration for me and for everyone in our community and all those who will end up finding this stumbling <laughs> upon it however they stumble upon it um, thank you darling thank you so much how are you feeling in yourself at the end of our conversation how has all of this moved you what is what has become more real to you in you because you're such a real person I can feel mm -hmm. it I know you're doing your holy work with such sincerity what has really given you inspiration um, it's so yes. touching Andrew that it brings tears it's so um <laughs> let's let me feel for a second if that's all right it's oh, it's this you're just, allowed to feel yes it's this, this deep recognition of, of, of her, of her, of, of her, this, oh, just her, her. How are we not seeing her yet? How do we not know her? How do we not love her gifts, her love, her, <laughs> and, and for us to have like recognized that and touched on that, um, his, that's the biggest thing the same way, darling. in this conversation. Her burning love can save us if we burn with it and act yeah. on that burning. Yeah. And her patience, she's just waiting for all of us to arrive. She's to, getting like, a lot less patient right now, isn't she? <laughs> She's absolutely totally patient and totally impatient at the same absolutely, time. Absolutely, absolutely. And she's like, I'm just, I'm here. I'm I'm here. And I, what I, more do you need to see how essential I am for you to be your true, beautiful, holy selves? What more do you need? Because I'm going to give it to you, whether you like it or not. Yeah. Because, not out of hatred but out of wild, fierce love. Wake up, wake, wake up. Wake up. Oh my gosh. Oh. Andrew, thank you. I love you. you, darling. I love you. I love you. It's an honor to speak to such a beautiful, embodied, divine human woman. Women like you are the most essential powers on the planet now. The Dalai Lama said the world will be saved by women. And you're one of those women and all the women listening, I bow to you all. I thank you all for turning up in your fullness now. We, I need you. All men need you. We I need just you totally. Bow. Give it to us. I just bow right back, Andrew. That's yeah. it. That's all I've got is just a bow right back. Thank you, Shita. I 
Take it and I give it. Thank you, God. Oh, 